Well, hi everyone. Uh, my name is John Ingram and I'm a clinical reader and consultant dermatologist based in Cardiff, UK. And my uh, central clinical and research focus is on hydrogenitis superativa HS. So that's why I'm here. Um, but um, uh, in this session, really, I'm, I'm handing across to, uh, to a colleague who has much more expertise than I do in this, in this area. Um, so I'm thrilled to be part, asked to be part of this global event for HS patients, and even more so to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Kimberly Kersine. Her talk was so well received last year that we decided to bring her back for round two. Dr. Kersine is the Director of Outpatient Supportive Care at Emory Palliative Care Centre. She's the director and the primary provider for the Supportive Oncology Clinic. The clinic provides physical, emotional and spiritual care for patients and also assists patients with complex decision making. Dr. Kersine uh, served as the program direct developer and director of the Geriatric Palliative Care Clinical Services Program at the University of Arkansas um, from 2009 to 14. Uh, she's board certified in internal medicine, geriatrics and palliative care, and has been named one of the palliative medicine inspirational leaders under 40 by the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine uh, quite recently. So we're in great hands. And thank you for joining us for a second year, Dr. Kersine, and over to you, please. All right, thank you so much. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Okay, so today we're gonna to talk about the experience of pain primarily focused on HS, and I'm really grateful to be able to speak to you today. Let's see. So I'd like to start off, I have, um, unfortunately I have no relevant disclosures. So I think it's all important that we are talking the same language. So when we talk about pain, what is pain? Well, it's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential, potential tissue damage described in such terms as that damage. So I really want you to start to think about that it's not associated with the actual damage to the tissue, but also the potential that the, the damage can cause. And we'll, and we'll understand why that's important a little bit later. So when we think of hydroadenitis um, superativa pain, you know, when we think about it, um, and I see a lot of patients um, um, struggling, you know, they usually have these questions that they want me to answer. Number one, why is it painful? Number two, why is it important to address the pain? You know, what are some of the barriers, or they tell me about the barriers they're running into? What are the options for pain control? And where do you seek help? Because all of those things can be um, very confusing. So I bring you back to the definition of pain. And the reason why I'm bringing you to this formal definition is because I think in order to work with your healthcare providers, you have to kind of know what we think and you have to know what's true. So number one, pain is a personal experience. It's influenced by the biological, social um, factors, but again, it's a personal experience. Um, pain and nociception, um, or the way you experience pain are different. Um, and it can't always be inferred solely from the activity of the sensory neurons. So basically that's a fancy way of saying is that even if you have a lot of tissue damage, if it's not painful to you, it's not painful to you. So the damage doesn't always second relate to the level of pain you're experiencing. Just as if maybe you have a wound that's healed, but it hurts and everybody says, well, why does it hurt? Well, you're still experiencing the pain even if the damage um, um, has, has healed. Um, also, the way you experience life and your culture influences your concept of pain and also influences the way you experience it. Um, we need to respect a rep uh, the report of pain. And although pain's important, it has an adaptive role. Uh, it does have a big ongo ongoing chronic pain, has effects on function, social, and psychological well-being. And verbal description is only one of the several behaviors to express pain. So even if you have, if if you're struggling to communicate, that doesn't necessarily mean um, that you um, you don't have pain. 
So why is it just painful? Well, so patients say, why am I itching and burning? Well, you, you go back to the types of pain. So when you hear the doctor say nociception, so what they're talking about is the pain from damage of the tissues. So that's that deep ache, somatic pain. There's visceral pain, the pain that occurs um, in the organs, and this is directly related to tissue damage. Then we have the more complicated pain, neuropathic pain, and that's complicated by the injury to the nerves, which happen peripherally, but affects the central nervous system because of the inputs and makes it difficult sometimes for you to distinguish um, where that pain is coming from and how and the nature of how the pain changes. So it tends to be poorly tolerated, hard to control, and it's secondary to those inflammatory effects on the nerves and the chronic insult that's happening. So if you have a chronic wound, you're going to be affecting the nerve there chronically, chronically swelling, and then over time your brain sort of gets confused and it remodels. So sometimes people will tell me, hey, I'm having pain, and then that deep itching Although you may not describe it as pain, it's mediated by the same force, as well as the creepy crawlies, the sense of hot and cold. So why is it important to address pain? Um, well, we need to address your pain because if it goes on too long, it leads to poor mental health. It makes it difficult to work and concentrate. It can impair your intimacy and your ability to be social. Um, and we also know that it does have increased risk for substance use disorders, secondary to severe psychological stress and the exposure over time to uh, medications that um, cause physical dependence. So when we think of acute pain, so everybody sort of understands this. The acute pain, it's sudden, it's well-defined, it's clear. Um, everybody believes that pain. You don't have to explain it. People, you know, you, you walk in and you're that kind of pain and everybody's like, that makes sense. I'm having sympathy pains. Um, acute pain crisis is where it's so bad that it crosses the threshold for where it becomes intolerable. And that's dependent on the way the person is experiencing the pain at the time, not necessarily how um, the change or, or the tissue um, damage. So what's chronic pain? Well, chronic pain is defined as the pain that persists longer than the course of natural healing. Chronic pain persists, usually we define it as long, greater than three months. However, it doesn't mean you're in pain all the time. It can be episodic. It can last months to years, so the pain can come and go. Um, there's difficult there's significant psychological and emotional um, effects. So when you're in acute pain, your heart rate's up, you're sweating, you're rocking back and forth. Um, everybody kind of knows it. You might even be crying. And, and chronic pain, you're not doing any of that. I mean, you can't cry forever. So eventually you start to accept it, but you just you display these other things like loss of appetite, sleep dep um, disturbance, depression, apathy, um, and it really starts to affect your ability um, to function in the way you want in the world. That also leads to this cycle, what we call total pain, um, because if you only affect the physical pain, only um, deal with the physical pain that a person is under, you really don't break the cycle because how you feel physically is very much related to how you feel psychologically. So if you have physical pain, it's hard to do activities, you get deconditioned, the, you know, you start, you know, you, you become sedentary, you get further um, deconditioned. However, that's really frustrating to you because now you have fear, anxiety, it's hard to participate in life, your mood gets poor, you become depressed. And when you're depressed, that interferes with your ability, um, the ability to compartmentalize your pain and changes the perception of pain, which then leads to more pain. So if I just break this chain here, and I don't break this chain here, these wheels are like gears, they're just going to keep turning. If I only deal with you psychologically, but I don't actually deal with your pain, <laughs> then this wheel is going to keep on turning, and we're not going to get anywhere. So we really need to deal with both. So when you're a physician, or your healthcare provider, you come and telling them that, hey, I have pain and distress, and they start um, talking to you about, are you anxiety? Do you have anxiety, depression? Have you had trauma? It's not because they don't believe you, but they know they need to treat both. 
So what are some of the barriers to addressing pain? So these are the things I hear from my patients. Number one, stigma. Um, I don't want to be seen as a drug seeker. I feel judged. And like the moment you hit the ER, um, you say pain and all the doctors stop listening. They hate going to the pharmacy because, you know, the pharmacists don't treat them so well. Everybody's, you know, judgy. And then if they find out that you do have an illness and everybody is, you know, is looking at you with sympathy, it's hard. Hey, I'm a fighter and I won't give in to this. And, you know, also the feelings of discrimination. Um, the side effects of these medications. Look, I don't want to take something I can become dependent on and, and possibly become addicted to. I don't want to be sleepy and constipated. Um, and you know what, Doc, I can't have my organs damaged too. I, I, ibuprofen works, but how long can I actually take it? Financial lim limitations. These medications are expensive. The co-pays are too high. There's a lack of knowledge um, or how to access resources. Um, we have, it's a, it's a thing here in the U.S. My doctor doesn't treat pain. There's nothing else to do um, because you become fatalistic. I just have to live with it. Or, you know, depending on where your specialists are, because there, we don't have an abundance of specialists, I can't even get to the appointment. And again, time you know, counseling and physical therapy and all of these other complimentary things we say you should do, that requires time and money. And some, and if you're working, you just can't stop in the middle of the day to go to therapy. And, you know, you're, you're living busy lives. Sometimes you just don't have time to deal with it now. So when we think, and when I'm working with somebody who has HS, I try to set the goal is like, we're going to have to deal with this from a multi-modal approach. So medications and complementary therapies are helpful, but they're not everything. Um, because this is a chronic, serious illness, just like cancer, just like lung disease, like dementia, that does have a psychological effect. And you have to have tools to be able to deal with that on your own and how to reconcile and how to live with this medical uncertainty. So that's where the CBT and the ACT and all the psychotherapy comes in. You need social support. You need, you know, you need to talk to other people who have this, who can be in a group and be in a community where you're not having to explain every little thing. And oftentimes these communities have better um, ideas about what to do you, um, for, for certain symptoms, sometimes better than your physicians do. And then we have to be thinking about interventions. Um, you know, nerve blocks and uh, interlesional injections. How do we do wound care? So there's lots of wonderful things on the horizon for interventional pain management that can apply um, um, to, your, um, to your illness. But we have to sort of think about it in that way. So what are your pain options? Um, when we think about acute pain, we usually start on something called the World Health Organization ladder. We start with acetaminophen and, and maybe NSAIDs, either topical or systemic. And then um, the drug that every um, geriatrician, somebody who takes care of older people, loves to hate, tramadol, or even sometimes a short-acting um, opiate for breakthrough. When we think of H, if we're going to really think about what's going to be in the best interest for you, you know. HS directed therapy, we need to understand the severity and we also need to make sure that the wound is okay. So if you treat the underlying problem, usually the pain gets better. We need to have a combination of good wound care, good support, and good physical therapy. In addition, instead of sort of thinking about how we manage analgesia from this stepwise, we're going to need to use several different things because we know you have tissue damage and we know you have neuropathic um, pain. So we need to probably start with those together. So um, there are several things we use for neuropathic pain, like abapentinoids, duloxetine, train name and Cymbalta, the little bouncing ball that says depression hurts. We're not giving it to you because you're depressed. We're giving it to you because it's a great drug for neuropathic pain. You only have to take it once a day versus the gabapentinoids that you have to take several times a day. Um, and then there's these adjuvant therapies, things that are topical. And, you know, and when the pain is very severe, you know, it's not inappropriate to to revert back to a short acting opiate, with our hope is that you don't have to be on these long term, and we'll talk about why. And then easier access to a pain specialist. So you're not trying to do this all on your own. So no talk about pain would be complete without discussing a little bit about medical cannabis. So why does this come up and why um, 
why are we thinking about this? Well, we're thinking about this because it's now become it's widely available. States, at least in the U.S., are making it you know legal. It still remains federally legal, but this is something that people are using, people are promoting. So it's really important that you have good information. So what's the promise of it? Well, there's evidence that it could be helpful for neuropathic pain and muscle spasticity, which is really important for you. It may help with itching, incredibly important for you. It can have, we believe, have a better side effect than opioid profiles, which we're hoping, we don't know for sure. Um, and antioxidant, it has some the antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. Um, theoretically, and unfortunately, because our research is behind, at least in this country, you know, to know that for sure, to have it actually tested in humans. But, you know, based on the structure, based on the lab studies, this seems like where this is going. The problem is it has poor evidence in HS, like many things and many things for symptom management does because we haven't focused on it. There is a risk of dependence. If you use it every day, your body gets used to it like anything else. High preparations in THC can alter mental um, status and have other unwanted side effects, particularly for people trying to function in the world. It can interfere with other medications. So if, you're, if you have a disease where you need to have um, blood thinning, or if you're a diabetic, or if you take other antidepressants, um, there are drug interactions. So you have to be cognizant and let your provider know what you're using. And because the quality control is not good, it's sometimes not always easy to know what the doses is. And it does interfere with anti-rejection um, um, medications. So, um, but when you're thinking about it, and we're, it's going to be really important um, to have a good understanding of why why we think it's working and what the parts do. So THC, which is that psychoactive part, that's the part that people normally um, associate it with the pleasurable um, recreational use. It can be sedating, relaxing. It's the psychoactive. It can alter the senses of sight, smell, and hearing. And why those are important is it's allowing you, this is the part that allows you to dissociate from the pain. So people say, you know, I still have the same pain, but you know what, for 20 minutes, I didn't care about it. Um, it can cause fatigue, but increases appetite, can reduce in, uh, regression, but um, it does seem to have the anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties. CBD, um, Chem is not psychoactive, so it should not alter you, but it does seem to have some antipsychotic properties. It can be anxiety reducing. Um, it does have uh, similar effects where we believe that it can possibly decrease inflammation based on its structure and other lab studies. And also just like THG can have some analgesic effect. Oftentimes people, you know, if they use one or the other outpatients use CBD and some of them really get a great benefit from it, but I do find patients do better when they're in combination. And what CBD does for THC is it balances it out. Lots of good reasons for that. So when you're thinking about, and if this is something that you're going to use and you will talk to your provider and make sure everybody knows what you're doing, you got to understand the strains because <laughs> if you use the wrong thing, you'll take it in like, oh my gosh, this is the most worst thing in the world. So sativa, they tend to have higher um, THC contents and lower CBD contents. And these are the ones that are energizing, uplifting, stimulates creativity, relieves headaches, migraines, nausea, um, but it's activating. So this is not one of the things you want to take at bedtime. Indica um, has, you know, higher uh, THC than CBD content. It's relaxing. It's the thing that makes you sleep. It reduces inflammation. It's, it's we believe that it's better for spasms. And again, they both um, seem to or have the potential to stimulate appetites. And hybrids are a combination of both. So if you're going to a provider and they're uh, offering you um, cannabis, sometimes patients are like, oh my gosh, Kim, I, I went to this, I went to a bud tender and he tried to sell me two things. And I said, did he tell you one was for the morning and one was for the evening? And I'm like, yeah, this is the reason why. And this is what they're trying to explain to you. But I think it's good to be good consumers so you know exactly what you are getting. Many people, however, will say one strain or the other is more helpful. Um, 
RSO or Rick Simpson oil. Rick Simpson oil became really popular, popularized as a possible treatment for cancer. There's no evidence that that, um, reliable evidence that that is true. But the reason why I explain this to you is that Rick Simpson oil is very high in THC and is not a pleasant thing to take. Um, the side effects are not long lasting. However, because of the increased THC content and because it's so concentrated, increased paranoia, depression, irritability, impaired memory, low blood pressure, impaired sleep. So this is not something that if you are over the age of 65, that you should, um, that I would recommend that you engage in secondary to the risk, even though you titrate very low doses, very low doses and up. Um, I have seen people really struggle to con um, um, tolerate that. The same thing with FICO or full cannabis extract oil, very similar to RSO, made with grain alcohol um, or ethanol. Um, you ingest it orally. This effect can also, like RSO, last for the full day and make it very difficult for you to do other things. So other things that you should be aware of. Um, Patients suffering from fatigue and depression may use sativa during the day um, and an indica strain at night for insomnia. A high CBD strains are preferred often by patients who are chronically ill. Um, it's, and this is the active ingredient that treats seizures. Um, again, reduces anxiety and pain um, and when it doesn't have the psychoactive effect. CBD from hemp, at least in this country, is made legal in 2020. And again, has some anti-inflammatory effects, we believe, seems to help with anxiety. Um, however, just like all good things are great until humans get involved, we are now um, extracting all the THC from the hemp plant into a concentration of called Delta-8 um, from the hemp. Currently, that doesn't have um, any real medical purpose, and I often tell people to avoid it for safety, not because the THC in the hemp plant is bad. It's just because we're not quite sure. This is even less regulated or less sort of thought through than the um, than the products that are made from traditional marijuana. And we have seen a lot of people um, get pretty ill with with it, or it be, or it can be incredibly potent and not always consistent. So, what about the opioids? Well, you know. It's significantly better pain relief versus placebo. They have been the mainstay um, to help people with acute pain. However, they don't seem to, if you have to take them long, long term, to outperform other um, medications for chronic pain. Opiates perform similar to non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, tricyclic antidepressants, those are like your elevils or your pamelors, anticonvulsants like your gabapentinoids, um, and physical function scores and neuropathic pains, um, tissue pain, and even the pain um, that comes from your brain when your brain has been in pain for a long time. The risk of opioids, um, you can develop physical dependence. And I tell people that that doesn't mean you're addicted. That means it's a side effect of the drug. If you take it more than 21 days, your body gets used to it. If you stop it, you run the risk of withdrawing from it. You can, it does put you in exposure at increased risk for addiction and opioid misuse disorder. Again, a side effect of, of the medication and that's not a moral failing. There's where it can be worse than depressant. It's a depressant. It can make the world a gray place for some patients and make it difficult to experience your full joy if you're taking it for long periods of time. And again, as you know, the constipation, the itching, the cloudiness for our men, the urinary retention, especially for our older men, dry mouth, and always the risk of unintentional over overdoses, especially if you have to interface with the medical system and get lots of other medications. Subset of opioids also have immunosuppressive properties that may cre increase the risk of infection infection, um, especially for those receiving um, immunomodulatory therapy. So, and we'll look at this in a little bit more detail. So, patients with extensive disease and organ dysfunction, sometimes opiates is the, 
excuse me, is actually the thing to use. So if your kidneys are infected or your liver's not working good, well, then all the adjuvants that we give you for the pain then become not a great long-term option. And this actually might be the best option. So we're not saying that we don't use these. If we are using them though, we have to continue to reassess the effectiveness, you know, try reductions to reduce the harm. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about buprenorphine. Um, buprenorphine, most people think about it as the medication in Suboxone for opioid misuse disorder, but it is can be a fantastic medication um, for pain, and it is a pretty strong opiate. Um, but it has some uh, um, decrease. It, the side effect profile is much better. Um, Oftentimes people will use tramadol, has a long acting um, preparation, but really try to avoid this in our, our older ad adults over the age of 65. We don't eat, tolerate this as well. And then again, if you are on antidepressants, it does increase the same serotonin just like your antidepressant does, and you do run the risk of having an interaction. Something called serotonin, serotonin syndrome happens when the serotonin is too high, but usually that's not what happens. What usually happens is that you feel anxious and weird and don't feel good when you're taking it because of the interaction before you get the serious one. So the myths about buprenorphine, because your doctors may offer this to you, you come in in pain, you're like, I'm just in pain for a little bit, I just need something to sort of get through this episode, and here we give you some buprenorphine, or we offer you some Suboxone in a film and ask you to cut it in force, and that's going to sound insane. But it's actually not insane. So the myth about buprenorphine is that it doesn't control pain. It controls pain just fine, um, can work really, really well. Um, that it's less potent than morphine. Absolutely not. When you are working with buprenorphine, we're giving you micrograms um, versus um, um, milligrams um, that's measured um, in morphine. And when you take a milligram of, of buprenorphine, that can hit you pretty hard. So you really want to make sure that you are kind of aware and talking with your providers because often providers may not be as educated in this area and could possibly give more than you need. It is a myth that you can't accidentally overdose on it. You can. Um, you have to work harder at the doses. It it usually, the thing we like about it is the risk of respiratory depression is lower, but it isn't zero. Um, and the naloxone, if you're using a preparation that has buprenorphine, which is an opiate agonist antagonist, and naloxone, which is the reversal agent, if you have those together, which is um, the trade name is Suboxone, um, that it won't work for pain control. And that's that's just not true. It, it doesn't really affect its, its pain management effect. So what are some of other opioid side effects that you need to be aware of if you have to be on them for a long time? Well, there is an increased risk of heart attack and stroke. Um, it's about as equal to non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Um, and some of the preparations like methadone, buprenorphine, and fentanyl um, can, increase, can increase the risk of um, arrhythmias or irregular heartbeats or changes in the way your heart functions electri electrically. Um, usually this is at high doses and people are, are fairly ill, but you do have to understand that that's a possibility. Again, the usual, the constant, constipation, nausea, falls. Again, immunosuppression, that tends to occur with morphine. Um, but not op all opiates have this. Actually, buprenorphine has it the least. Your endocrine system can be affected if you have to take this long term. And this can be really hard, especially for our younger men, is that if, they have to, if they're taking opiates for years and years, it really wipes out their testosterone, can decrease, um, cause muscle loss. All of a sudden, my ladies come back to me with, why am I having hot flashes? Well... <laughs> I have good news and bad news. It can make you tired, increase risk of insulin resistance, and can interfere with your libido and sexual drive. Um, and, and if you have to take it for a long time, it can increase the risk of osteoporosis and fracture. Other side effects, um, if you tend towards depression or have depression um, and you see a psychiatrist, they always want you to get off the opiates because it um, makes it really hard to um, treat your depression. Um, you can develop neurotoxicity from it if the dose is too high. That's that jerking. That's not a seizure. That just is letting us know that the threshold of your opiate is too high. Um, there can be confusion. Um, again, if you have obstructive sleep apnea or disordered breathing, you have to be very, very careful because your risk of respiratory depression and compromise is a lot, is a lot higher. And again, urinary and dry mouth.
which affects your teeth and other things. So what about psychological therapy? So anxiety, we know that depression and anxiety is very common um, in patients with um, HS. And, and if you have depression, anxiety, that affects your ability to, um, or how you perceive pain or how you manage it or are able to compartmentalize it. So there are two evidence-based therapies. One is cognitive behavioral therapy. It's the first line in psychosocial chronic pain treatment. And the second is acceptance and commitment therapy. CBT, as we call it, is structured. So when you go, when we're recommending that you go to these therapists, we're not asking somebody to pick around in your brain. Um, if you're not up for sort of having that sort of talk therapy, if that's not something that's helpful for you, but the structured sessions that actually give you tools to empower yourself with how you manage pain and how you live with the medical uncertainty can be really important. And it's all about empowering and you have the ability to do things and take some control back over your life versus us controlling everything about your life, which happens when you have a chronic illness. The other thing to consider are your complementary therapies. And so um, there, there are several. So there's a lack of evidence of, of acupuncture um, in HS, but this may be the thing that insurance covers. And the lack of evidence doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means that we haven't invested um, in studying it in, in a proper way. There's mind-body interventions, um, energy um, therapies, other supplements that might be helpful, um, low-dose naltrexone. So this is a very um, low-dose of, of a medication that works against the opioid receptor. And the cool thing about it is if you take that long enough, all of a sudden you have endogenous opioids. So yes, you have opioid and opioid-like um, um, substances in your bodies that hit your brain. That's like if you ever had a runner's high or you've been dancing all night and you just hit that thing and you can feel like you can dance forever. Those are your endogenous um, opioids and those are amazing. And that's what this drug tries to increase. Um, alpha lipoic acid can help with neuropathic pain. And when you take it, it doesn't, it's not like fish oil, you don't taste fishy. Um, turmeric or curcumin has anti-inflammatory effects. Cherry juice. So this is why, you know, oh, I heard and somebody keeps trying to offer you some drink or some cherry juice. It actually helps. And then ginger, devil's claw, and, and boswella are, are all um, medication, are all um, supplements that people use. Just make sure that if you're going to use one of these supplements, number one, you talk to somebody who's knowledgeable about them, you get them from a knowledgeable source, and then you let your providers know what you're taking to make sure they're not any um, drug interactions. So where should you seek help? Okay. Before you even go to find help for your pain, you got to ask yourself some questions. What am I going to expect from this visit? Do I need help with my pain that I have right now? Or do I want them to address chronic pain? Or do I want this person to be able to address both? Am I open to non-medical therapies? So basically, am I open when I say to fancy medicine, like procedures and stimulators and all, uh, all things that might be on the cutting edge? Is there something I'm not willing to consider? Do you have a line in the sand? Like, doc, I'll do anything for you, but I'm never taking an opioid, so you just got to figure something out. Do you um, want to avoid traditional pharmacotherapy, right? Because if you don't want to do that, then you go to an allopathic doctor, like an MD or a DO. Let's say if you go to a plumber, you're going to get your pipes fixed. So we're probably not going to be the place that you're going to ask um, because oftentimes your allopathic doctors, your MDs and DOs are not very trained very well in this area. What are your options for insurance company? Like what's going to pay? How much it's going to cost you? Are you willing to deal with the emotional aspects of your pain? And do you feel like you can effectively advocate for yourself or do you need to go with a support system so you don't feel like like you're not heard or that you run over? Um, so when you prepare for pain management, you got to understand what's going on in our brains. Number one, we're, our pain management training is terrible. It's getting better. Medical schools are starting to do this, but um, your gray hairs like me, we were not trained well. The response to the opioid crisis has been punitive. And so because that has been punitive, that has made us very frightened. And now we have criminalized um, patients who have developed opioid misuse disorder, which is a medical condition. And because that has happened, all the doctors are just um, are, are, are really are really nervous and upset and afraid to prescribe. Um, 
There's practice policies that may dictate and limit treatment. Some practices will not treat pain. And there's also bias and structural racism and socioeconomic discrimination that is built into the medical system that makes it difficult um, for minoritized populations to be treated properly for pain. Um, the other thing that you can do is keep a pain diary. So you, if you understand your pain, you can explain it to us better. And I love a patient who brings a notebook. Um, you want to set some realistic expectations. We're not going to be able to get your pain to zero. Um, our goal is to get you to an acceptable quality of life where you can function. Um, long term, our monotherapy with opioids is no longer considered standard of care for chronic pain. So, you know, go kind of going into this, just sort of know that, that you will be offered other things, and that's actually appropriate. You will have to do controlled substance agreements, urine toxicology screens. Sometimes laws require this. They may give you naloxone or the rescue medication. Your insurance company will, may have pill, um, pill limits. Your insurance company might actually require um, dose reductions routinely. Appointments can be rigid, um, especially if you're going to um, pain management clinics, and those clinics have to do that. Pain level and character may change over time, so it's nothing that you're doing wrong. It's not that your medications aren't working, but if you have an area that's painful, it's, it's dynamic. It's not going to stay the same, so your medications will change over time. They'll go up, they'll go down, um, and there's nothing wrong, um, nothing that you're doing to make that worse. And finding a therapeutic relationship with somebody to manage your pain can be a challenge. So, so who, who, should, who should you seek help from? Okay, so pain management specialists. These are what I call our fancy pain doctors. They specialize in evaluation, diagnosis, and treatment of pain. And many of these types of doctors really specialize in interventions and non-pharmacologic therapy, which can be very helpful. Um, pain psychologists. These are people who actually deal with the psychology of pain. They may be the people who are offering the CBT and the ACT. They will actually say in their lines that they help treat chronic pain, PS, um, PTSD, and people with, and you really, if you can find somebody that treats chronic illness, that's great. Physical medicine and rehabilitation specialists. These people are incredibly important because no matter what we do, you have to be able to function. So I might be able to get you pain-free with my medications as long as you're staying perfectly still. But if you have contractures in your skin, you know, you know, how am I going to work how, and and you know and live my daily life? They can actually help you get back there. Um, sometimes without. Um, surgical intervention. There's some other steps you can take if that's not something that you want to do. Um, palliative care specialists, people like me, we work um, with people who live with serious illness, life-threatening illnesses, and we provide um, relief from the symptoms and the stresses of those illnesses, and we work with a team. So nurses, doctors, social workers, um, spiritual health clinicians, to provide an extra layer of support um, with, your, with your dermatologists or your surgeons. Palliative care has not entered into this place, uh, you know, um, heavily, but we're starting to. Naturopathic doctors, these are doctors and they actually receive medical training and they understand the complementary therapies, the supplements, and they understand the literature and they can help you. They're not allopathic. Um, naturopath practitioners, however, are not doctors. Um, Integrated medic medicine specialists, those are specialists who approach uh, patients as a whole person, and they focus on healing and really going with wellness, and they work with the various complementary um, disciplines. How palliative care specialists are a little different is integrative me medicine specialists are trying to get you back to wellness. Palliative care specialists want you to get to wellness, but we understand that that may not um, happen in the way that we hoped. Okay. So in the interest of time, if you get these slides, this is just sort of letting you know what each person does. And just in summary, um, pain has to be a part of the management of HS to have a quality of life. No point in treating you if you're not going to have uh, an acceptable quality of life. Um, it, HS patients need to understand pain and understand their pain options so you can have more control over your health care. The more you know, the better things are. Um, opiates do have a place. 
but should be used um, cautiously for long-term management. But if we have to, we can and we can make it safe. And healthcare system has to acknowledge the barriers to effective pain management that you face. And advocacy groups like this need to ring the bell to make sure that you have access to quality, high quality pain management and the healthcare providers um, are educated to be able to care for you properly. So I'm sorry if I went a little bit over, but I, I really want to thank you so much for your time. And thank you, Dr. Kassin. That was a, a wonderful um, overview of, uh, of all the detail that I think many dermatologists uh, struggle with. Uh, and of course, our patients um, uh, are not getting access to. So that was tremendous. And I think uh, probably because in the interest of time, we um, have to, to move on. I wonder whether we might be able to allow people to use the chat function just to um, submit some questions and maybe you might be able to, to come back to, uh, to spotlight afterwards with some extra answers. That would be tremendous. So I think you know we have to uh, come to the end of our session now. Um, thank you to everyone for, um, for your attention and as we go into the last break of Spotlight HS, maybe uh, I suggest grab some water the next session will be a bit more physically interactive because we've got Judy Fernandez talking to us about wellness and yoga uh, and how that might relate to HS. So uh, uh, thank you again for your attention and to um, Dr. Kasim for a wonderful talk and uh, enjoy the next session on uh, with, with the uh, spotlight on yoga. Take care, everyone. <laughs>